Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How's it going today? I hope you're well. Today we are going to be revisiting an incident that took place back in 2012. And what's interesting about this is I've been kind of, this is an incident that it, it always comes up, I always remember it. Sometimes I go back to it and finally I was like, you know what, let me start researching this some, you know, to be able to make a little video on it. And with the events that have taken place in these last, well, almost 48 hours at this point uh, with the events in Ohio and Texas. I just thought it was kind of interesting how I was already planning on doing this video. So it gives it kind of a different context for me because it makes it even more surreal if that makes sense. So, but today what we're gonna be talking about is a case that a lot of us are gonna remember this case because of the antics of the perpetrator uh, that took place in the courtroom during the impact statements and towards his victims' families. The behavior displayed by him in the courtroom was heinous, it was shocking, it was uncalled for, but his crimes were too. I have not seen someone do this kind of next level stuff, especially during impact statements. I don't think ever. So if you know of other ones like that, please drop them in the comments. But today we are going to be revisiting the case of TJ Lane. Now he is the one who perpetrated the Chardon High School tragedy in Chardon, Ohio. So I've got my coffee. Go ahead and get you a cup, pull up on the sofa, and let's dig into this. So let's revisit the day of the incident. Now, at about 7.30 a.m. on February 27, 2012, T.J. Lane walked into the school cafeteria at Chardon High School. Again, that was in Chardon, Ohio. He opened fire using a 22 caliber handgun. Now, when he was done with this, three students would have lost their lives. One student would end up permanently disabled, confined to a wheelchair. Uh, another one would suffer a minor injury. Another one would suffer a superficial one. But the town and its people would be forever changed. Now, I want to kind of look at two people who were considered heroes of that day. There were many heroes of that day, but these two people were kind of highlighted for their actions. Uh, and that's going to be Joseph Rick and Frank Hall. Now they were two teachers referred to you know as heroes for their acts of bravery when all this took place. Now Ricky had just started his math class when he heard the shooting and he ordered his students to lock down and he heard moaning or something like that in the hallway and so he pulled an injured student into the classroom and applied first aid to them. Now other witnesses say that Hall, the assistant football coach, he charged toward Lane while he was still armed and chased him out of the school where he was later captured by the police. Now, during a 911 phone call from a student, they identified TJ as Thomas Lane. And they stated that they were standing next to him when he pulled the gun out. And they saw him shoot two students, their bodies hit the floor, and the caller basically ran. They didn't know if the students were alive or not, but they ran for safety. And, you know, he just said that Thomas was a quiet kid who didn't really talk to anyone at school. Uh, he said the shooting appeared to be random with no one specific in mind. Although other reports from eyewitnesses claimed that it did look like he was targeting one specific group of boys. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the victims here. The first deceased student was identified as Daniel Parmeter, and he was a 16-year-old high school junior. Uh, now when a Lane opened fire, Daniel was in the cafeteria waiting for a bus to go to the Auburn Career Center, uh, which is a vocational school in nearby Concord Township, and he studied computer science there. Now, most of these kids were going there, and we'll learn that Lane actually didn't go to the high school that the shooting took place at. He went to basically a, a, an alternative high school. Okay, so the second student, Russell King Jr., was 17, and he was pronounced brain dead at the Metro Health Medical Center. Uh, he studied alternative, alternative energy technologies, and he was enrolled in both Chardon High School and at the Auburn Career Center. Now, a witness, Nate Mueller, said that King had recently started dating Lane's former girlfriend. Other student witnesses said that it looked like Lane was specifically aiming for King. So, and they indicated that he seemed to be the first one to be shot. Uh, now, the students say that King had previously threatened to beat Lane up. And they told reporters that Lane had taken up weightlifting with the intention of fighting King. Now, of course, this is, you know, uh, allegedly that type of stuff. So, but this is really the only type of... Uh, motive that they could seem to find in this crime. So, 
Now, on February 28th, 2012, uh, Demetrius Hewlin, who was another student that was transferred to the hospital, had died. Uh, so that was the third victim there. One of the two injured students who had been transferred to the Hillcrest Hospital, uh, his name was, he was 17 years old, his name was Nick Walczak, and he was shot several times, and one bullet lodged in his cheek, and he was also shot in like the arm and the neck and the back. Now, Joy Rickers, 18, she was released from Hillcrest on the 28th, and then there was another student, Nate, he wasn't hospitalized, but he had like a nick in his right ear. So, now the student, Nick, was paralyzed for life after that. And so those were the immediate victims, as I like to say, in these cases. What I mean by immediate victims is they took, say, a direct impact. I always compare what I call victims in crimes to the rings of a tree. And at the center, you have the direct victims. And so in this case, it's these you know unfortunate students whose lives were taken or forever altered. But then right in that next ring, you have, you know, the people who were sitting there and traumatized, the families that, you know, lost their sons or daughters, things of this nature, uh, all the way out to the people, you know, the secretary of the school whose life forever changed after the things she saw, the paramedics who had to deal with that, with the town and all that. These crimes just, they don't just affect the immediate victims who obviously they suffer the biggest tragedy, but they pollute the entire area around them and devastate lives all around them. Now, again, Another student there at the school had stated that the victims were students who attended the nearby vocational school and they were waiting for a bus to take them there. So I guess like the lunchroom was like the area where everybody held and waited for, the, you know, was waiting for these buses to come pick them up to go to various schools. He said that Lane himself was a student at Lake Academy Alternative School. And basically like these, all these people rode the same bus. Uh, apparently Lane's stop was farther than the other ones or something like that. So I, I, the, what I'm reading between the lines with this is that whatever he was going to do, he knew he had to kind of do it there at the school. And probably that had a bigger impact on people and that type thing. Now again, we don't have a 100% motive for this, but it does look like there is some kind of bad blood between him and one of these kids. And who knows, you know, I mean, maybe that's enough to trigger somebody to go do something awful like this. Now, let's go ahead and talk about some of the aftermath of this crime. Now, in the wake of the county, the governor had the flags at the state house and around the county flown at half staff. Uh, obviously, numerous vigils hand that night uh, took place that night. Uh, now, March 2nd, there was a gradual return to school for both the students and staff and counseling was provided and the united way had set up a healing fund for those traumatized by the shooting and like it had gained like $150,000 almost overnight now one thing that was really awesome about this is when students returned to school they were greeted with this very warm welcome uh, and a student from an, a high school her and her mother and a neighbor organized what was called line up at chardon and basically all these people came and they lined up and they had a giant sign that said Out Stand By You, which was a reference to the song by the Pretenders, and more than like a hundred children from surrounding school districts, they all came to show support and to greet the students coming back in. And I just thought that was really, really beautiful. Uh, you know, because a lot of times in these tragedies, when these tragedies happen, there's the 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 awfulness of the tragedy, but then there's the humanity of the good in people that come out during these tragedies. Now, all, that's always there, but it becomes prevalent and helps so many people get through that. And so I thought that this was another one of those human moments of people supporting around one another to, you know, keep everything going, to keep life going. Now, the opposite end of that humanity is this little aspect. So, like I said, there's always, you know, yin and yang to everything. So, the Westboro Baptist Church had sent out a tweet stating that they were going to street preach and protest Daniel's funeral. So, I will never understand for the life of me how when tragedy happens like this, somebody wants to come and make it even worse for the victims and the town and the people. I will never understand that. Probably hope I never do. Now, in response to that, and again, the yin and the yang here, a Chardon resident, Alec Pavlik, he sent out a request on Facebook for people to join him in forming a barricade around St. Mary's Church where the funeral was going to take place. And like 1,600 people turned out and formed a human barricade. Uh, but the Westboro Baptist Church never, they never showed up to begin with. Yay. So now, let's go back and explore a little bit more like who was TJ Lane. 
Now, like I said before, a lot of us are going to remember, and I'm going to be putting some photos up here, you know, we're going to remember these images from the courtroom, you know, of during sentencing and impact statements and stuff of these things that he did. I mean, I remember the first time I saw the video, I was like, I mean, who does that? So a lot of us remember that. But it, what's interesting about this case is there's just not that much to this guy. So let's just jump down into it and see if there's any signs that we can see you know, about what led up to this. Now his name is actually Thomas Michael T.J. Lane III. He was born September 19th, 1994. Now at the time of the shooting, like I said, he wasn't taking classes at Chardon High School, but in a, at an alternative high school. And it's basically designed for students with like academic and behavioral needs, which seemed to be an issue with him. Now, students who go to the school, if they complete their education there, it's essentially like they can graduate with their class on time type thing. So it is a way to like try and keep these kids, you know, in an environment to keep them going and not have another nick of they didn't finish school. Now, a friend of TJ's described him as basically like a totally normal teenage boy. Uh, she also told CNN that she was in complete shock from the incident and that Lane had often had like a sad look in his eyes, but came across as totally normal. Now, another friend said that Lane was regularly teased at school, uh, which made Lane put a wall around himself. And he really didn't divulge personal information to people. And another student told reporters that Lane had come from like a really broken down home. And he was really quiet and he could be nice to others if he felt comfortable with them. Now, what I've been able to kind of decipher from a lot of this stuff is that he was living mostly with his grandparents. And it just sounds to me like, you know, a broken home. I mean, I, you know, I couldn't get too many details of it, but there were some issues going on there. Now, I'm looking back at some of like my experience, but also people that I saw in school who, you know, I really wasn't a quiet type person myself, but I can think of kids in my school that were quiet. They might not have necessarily been bullied, but, you know, they were the quiet type kids. And there wasn't really anything abnormal about them. They just kind of blended in. But sometimes that blending in, that invisible feeling can be so intense to people. So, you know, when I read this through here with him, I was like, okay, he clearly had some kind of academic behavioral issues. But, you know, overall, people just kind of described him as this somewhat just kind of quiet, I'm going to use the word bland maybe, you know, just very blended into the wall type situation. Now, students at Lake Academy said that he had not been bullied. Uh, they described him as friendly and nice, but not really talkative. So this all kind of just plays into that wallflower type personality that I'm thinking he was. So now one aspect that could have been like a little glimpse into his mind came from this like really long poetic type rant on Facebook. And I'm just going to read a couple of little quick blurbs from it here. Uh, in a quaint lonely town where there sits a man with a frown who longed for one thing, the world to bow at his feet. He was better than the rest, all those ones he detest, with their castles so vain. He said, later thanking those who liked the post and saying he'd written it in class one day. Now, he concluded that post by writing, die all of you. Now, one thing that I think is interesting with him that we see, and a lot of times I think we see this, is this level of entitlement. I mean, just reading these couple of lines here, I mean, he, this is a very smug individual. You know, this is somebody who is sitting by and studying people around him and they don't like it. They don't like what they're seeing. Now, any of us, if we're being picked on or something like that, we're going to have some animosity towards people who do that. So now again, some of this information, when you start to piece it together, such as, you know, okay, the, the, one of his victims who allegedly has started going out with his girlfriend, they were going to fight things of this nature. You know, if this guy maybe was bigger than Lane or something to that level and, you know, say Lane, you know, cause he was going to go to the gym and start working out. So Lane could have been completely smug and resentful to this guy and living in his own world. I mean, there's probably something going on there that led to him up to saying, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. My life is worth exchanging to take these victims lives for whatever cause, which I mean, to me, it just kind of seems like someone who just hated the world. Now, Lane did have some prior offenses, which could also be another glimpse into things. Uh, on February 29, 2012, uh, the juvenile court judge presiding over Lane's case allowed the release of the suspect's juvenile records to the press. 
And according to his records, Lane was arrested twice in 09. Uh, the first time, Lane restrained his uncle while his cousin hit him. And the other case involved Lane hitting another boy in the face. Uh, and to the second charge, Lane had pleaded guilty to like a count of quarter, uh, orderly, disorderly conduct. So I'm not sure how he arrived at those charges. They're kind of obscure. I mean, the whole thing of his holding his uncle while his cousin hit him is kind of bizarre. Uh, the other one. So obviously there's some anger issues going on here. So I think that that kind of gives us a clue as to this resentful, smug angerness that was building up in him. So let's go ahead and talk about the trial sum. Now, March 1st, 2012, the prosecutors formally charged Lane with three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of aggravated attempted murder, and one count of felony, fel, felonious assault. Now, he didn't enter a plea when he was arraigned on March 6th. Uh, and two of additional defense attorneys were assigned to the case in March. Uh, the judge postponed the decision to try Lane as adult until after competency evaluation was completed. Now, on April 9th, Lane appeared again before the judge who set the date for competency hearing on May 2nd. And he also scheduled a hearing for May 12th to determine whether the defendant would be tried as an adult. So, I mean, remember in these cases, I mean, he was a teenager. And so that becomes a huge point of contingency with some of these cases where these teens do these horrifying crimes. You know, do you charge them as an adult or as a youth or what? So let's continue. He said the defendant was suffering from psychosis that caused hallucinations and loss of contact with reality. But he said that does not interfere with Lane's ability to understand the charges against him. So they determined that he was competent to stand trial. Now, I always find it very interesting because, again, I mean, to me, just very quickly glossing over the case, I'm like, oh, this kid knew what he was doing and he knew it was right or wrong. To me, I look at it that way. But what's interesting to me is, you know, someone like this can come by and say, oh, he hallucinates and he doesn't have contact with reality, you know, but he can stand trial. And now I'm not trying to advocate that oh he should be you know found mentally insane you know even though i think obviously somebody's not right that does this but i just find that the the lines of sanity and not not saying insanity whatever you want to call it uh, are so very interesting now in june 2012 it was determined that lane was going to be tried as an adult and he was indicted on the six charges that were filed earlier in march and again, those were three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of felonious assault. Now, on June 8th, he pleaded not guilty to those charges. His bail was like a million dollars, and he was scheduled to be transferred uh, from the juvenile detention center to county jail on June 18th. Now, one thing I think is interesting with this case is that he actually ended up remaining in juvenile detention center while awaiting trial because... Phew, someone agreed to pay the bill for him to be housed there. So I'm guessing maybe his parents or some, I mean, who knows, but somebody close to the family, his grandparents, I don't know. Uh, because again, remember, this is like a teenager. And this is one thing that I think with some of these people, I'm just like, do you know? I mean, I guess they don't think, you know, but it's just like, okay, if this teen is going into an adult prison, I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to be well for you, dude. You know, and I often wonder with them, like, once they get into jail and these places like that, does reality set in of what have I done? Yeah, you know, because I think a lot of times these people like this, they're not concerned about what they've done to somebody else, which is why they need to be in jail. But I, I'm like, okay, when you yourself are in danger, so like when TJ was in danger, does that when the reality sets in of, oh, no, I didn't want to do this because now my life is in jeopardy. You know, we'll probably never know. Now, on March 19th, 2013, Lane was sentenced to three life sentences in prison without parole. And this leads into the infamous YouTube video that we've all probably seen. So, after entering the courtroom, Lane takes off his dress shirt to reveal a t-shirt under underneath, which had a specific word written on it. You can see it in the picture here. And it was handwritten across the front. And he smiled and smirked with the most smug, condescending look on his face at the victim's families. I mean, I don't know how they didn't come up over the, the podium and get him. Um, now, after being sentenced, Lane said to the victim's family and the courtroom, and I'm going to put it on the screen here because I'm trying not to get, you know, my videos demonetized here. Uh, so I'll read some of it. Uh, this hand that pulled the trigger that, that killed your son now blanks to the memory. F all of you. And he gave them the middle finger. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? 
are you kidding me? For him to sit there while the parents are falling all over themselves, crying and yelling at him, and he just sat there like this. That was the look on his face, looking at the parents, just like, you know, so happy that he took their children out of this planet, you know, out of this realm. And I'm just like, how, I mean, what, how can you do that? Like, because I'm just like, he's been incarcerated at that point. You, you would think there would be some resemblance of what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? But mm -mm, nope, still just as upset, if not more. So then my question was, you know, well, what's TJ up to? So I went and did a little bit of digging and really, you know, he's been up to some interesting things. So 2013 reports from the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio, uh, which is where he was. They indicated that he had already been in trouble for like giving himself a tattoo, uh, refusing to carry out work related assignments. And he had been like verbally reprimanded and punished with like the loss of recreation time. Now, in 2014, an appeals court upheld the sentence handed down to Lane, and you can also imagine that his antics in the courtroom had something to do with that. Uh, let's see. Now, it's, so the most interesting thing that came about with TJ was 7.38 p.m. September 11th, 2014, Lane escaped from the Allen Correctional Institution along with two other inmates. Now, they escaped using like a makeshift ladder to scale a fence during recreation hours. So one of the one of the escapees was quickly captured and Lane and the other in, inmate, uh, who the other inmate was just serving like a 12-year sentence for aggravated battery. So I'm not sure why he wanted to make that even worse by escaping um but the following day they were captured near the woods and <clears throat> they shut down chardon high school obviously the same day that they got out they made counselors available to people and again it's just one of those things where i'm like how haunting you know because again that's the legacy you've left is they have to shut the high school down because they're afraid you're gonna come back and pull some more next level stuff i mean it's just awful now, later the same day when they got caught, they were shipped right on out to Ohio State Penitentiary, which is like a supermax prison in Youngstown, Ohio. And there he spent like 23 hours a day in a cell, cell the size of a parking space. Uh, he would only get like one hour of recreation per day. And now he's being held in Warren Correctional Institution in Lebanon, Ohio. Now, Warren is listed as like a close security class, which in Ohio's rankings, kind of like in the middle of everything. And just some quick facts about it. It was open in 89, 1989. Uh, it sits in about 45 acres. Um, it, it has a staff of about 376, and the population as of like July 1st was 1,339. So, you know, it sounds like it's, it's a medium security prison. So he must have, you know, done well or something like that to get him back out of Supermax. I mean, I don't know. We'll see if he tries to escape again. So now let's look at some of the after effects that, you know, his action caused to those around him. So lawsuits. 2014, the family of TJ Lane agreed to pay almost $2.7 million to settle wrongful death lawsuits filed by the families of the three Chardon High School students. Uh, who were his victims. Each of these families is going to receive around $890,000. The lawyers will get 40%. And uh, now the money is believed to be coming from settlements reached in two other lawsuits filed in the aftermath of all this. Now also another lawsuit involving his grandfather, Jack Nolan, uh, and his insurer nationwide property and casualty. Those were filed and you know there was some kind of uh, you know agreement that came but it wasn't made public. So what I'm guessing is somehow his family sued their insurance or that somehow they got money from this and then the families in turn got that money. And maybe it could come first like they did this and so they fought, did the insurance something took place there so you know you can obviously can't put a dollar amount on lives but at least that money is going toward the victim's families and again i don't know the the degree of it because to me the way i read it honestly as i was just like oh his family somehow got money from their insurers because of this and then the victim's families were like wait you're not going to get that we're going to get it from you you know how dare you but that's i don't know if that's exactly how it went so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about what I consider to be other victims of the day. Now these people might not have been directly affected, meaning they were shot, 
but they were directly affected by this. They were right there. Or even people spanning out that might not have been immediately there, but maybe at the school or had children that went to the school. Uh, I think this is another part of the victimization with these crimes that takes place that oftentimes once once everything's gone, once the media's gone, once the spotlight off the crime is gone, these scars are still there with so many people and it affects so many different people in so many different ways. So the first one I want to look at is by a guy named Danny. <clears throat> and now before I sit, go into this, I've kind of jumped ahead, so let me backtrack a little bit. There's an article in Esquire magazine that does a follow-up to this town. I'm going to link it in the pinned comments down here. It is amazing. And so this information here, I'm just quickly kind of reviewing some of it. It's a very long, in-depth article. And the interviewer goes and talks to these people in-depth and gives you a really great insight into what their lives are like now and what a town looks like after a situation like this takes place. So the first person we're going to look at is Danny. Now, he was friends with all of these boys that were killed. He was sitting there at the table with them. He was especially close with Russell King. They were like brothers, he said. And now Danny said that he was looking at Russell when it happened. He said there's a popping sound, and all of a sudden Russell just abruptly slumped over and his head smacked onto the table. And Danny turned around, and he said that there was TJ standing at the table behind him with a gun pointed at him. And Danny basically said, that his reaction was to kind of jump, you know, slump, fly back down onto the table with his arm over his head. And he said, you know, before he did that, they made eye contact. He's staring at him. And so he went like this. And he said that he felt the other shot that came, like whiz by his head or maybe his ear or something like that. And that was the shot that killed Demetrius. So Danny now has a job at the drywall company. His boss has really taken him in. He understands the situation. And so Danny said, you know, there's some days he said where I just, I can't do it. I can't get out of bed. And his boss is very understanding. Or he might be at work and something triggers him. And he's like, I, I can't do that. I've, I've got to get away. You know, loud noises, things of that nature. Kind of like typical signs of like PTSD, trauma, things of that nature. Now, other type people that have been affected by this, uh, Russell's father, one of the victims, uh, on the second anniversary of the shooting his dad died at age 48 from an overdose of heroin and alcohol now i don't know if that issue was going on beforehand or after uh but you can i mean i can't imagine losing anyone to a crime like this or a crime of any type but especially a, a child i mean you just don't think when your kids go off to school that something like this could remotely happen and even in this day and age now where we live where this has pretty much become the norm i mean this is happening constantly as i mean we've just seen there's been two mass shootings in 24 hours so but you still just you just don't think that and towns like this this small town you know these are oftentimes the places where you hear this kind of stuff doesn't happen here you know this happens in cities and things of that nature well that landscape unfortunately has changed now this article also talked to uh, a gentleman named Brandon who was a teacher at this high school and he still was working at the same school and he eventually had to take like a six month leave. His life essentially, he, he was engaged, they bought a house and he eventually had to say to his fiance, look I just, I can't marry you right now because I'm not, I'm not there you know, type thing. He took a six month leave, he traveled, he did whatever he could and he finally discovered, you know what I, I have PTSD, this is what's going on and he kind of goes into detail about, you know what his symptoms were and things of that nature and he, his journey to discovering how to manage his PTSD. And, and that's a thing that we see in a lot of these people here is the, the post-traumatic syndrome disorder. Uh, you know, and this is, I mean, obviously this would be expected. This is a traumatic event. And so there's little things like this that, you know, the, the interviewer talked to people in town where, you know, when they go to a restaurant, they have to sit with their back to the wall. Uh, if they hear a loud noise, it just it shatters their nerves. And, and so things like that. And again, some of these people are people that say they might not have witnessed that, but they were in the building somewhere. They heard the gunshot or whatever. So, because that's one thing too. I mean, gunshots obviously are very loud. Uh, I don't know what a gunshot would sound like in a closed, like in a, you know, in an office building, a school, a mall. I can only imagine it's a deafening sound and a horrifying sound at that. So moving forward after that, any kind of a loud noise, I'm sure it's just, you know, your nerves are shot. You know, and finally they talked to one person whose daughter was a student there and was in her Spanish class. So she wasn't, you know, directly affected. She wasn't in the lunchroom. She didn't see any of the, the trauma to these people. Uh, but 
you know, her mother watch what goes on with her daughter. And she's like, you know, when I see these school shootings happening, it's, it just, it relives the day every single time for us. And she's like, and I know what these families are getting ready to go through. You know, she's like, I watch it with my daughter all the time. And that's just where these crimes continually re-victimize and re-victimize and stretch out and stretch out and pollute a, an entire community unfortunately uh you know they didn't ask for this or deserve this of course so on that note we're gonna go ahead and wind this up that was the case of tj lane and you know obviously i invite you if you want to go look at more of this information there's lots more on the internet there i just kind of went over the things that i found to be of interest in this case uh there's always as I always say, I'm not the end-all, be-all information, Mr. Google. So if you do want to learn more about this, be sure and check more of it out. Like I said, there's going to be a link in the in the pinned comment uh, to the article from the Esquire magazine. And I think it's a great thing to read, even for even if you're not that interested in the aftermath of a shooting. Uh, it's an excellent article and the human condition, I call it, and what it means to be human and what it means to survive after trauma of any sort. So I hope you all have a great day. Uh, don't forget, if you want to subscribe to my channel, to click that bell next to it so you'll know when I'm here in YouTube land. And there's lots of links down in the description uh, to social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. There's also a new podcast. The links are all down there in your favorite listening platforms. The podcast is different content than is on here in the videos. So be be sure and look into that too. I appreciate you hanging out with me and I will talk to you soon. Bye.